So thank you, Olga, uh, again for introducing us so nicely. Um, yeah, let's come to the Thursday webinar in our series, in uh, which we like to present you the good news, which comes with the new version 2023. Um, we have decided to do this webinar series um, with, together with the release, because first of all, we have quite something to talk about of new features, but in particular also because we like to strengthen our communication to our user community and potential growing, not always growing community and potential customers, um, to, uh, to strengthen the communication about the concepts inside Virtual Lab and how it works. Because of course it helps to use the software in a, in a good way if you have a better understanding of it. As I mentioned already in webinars before, that is not absolutely demanded if you like to use Virtual Lab, of course, but it helps, that's for sure. And uh, we will also do the following, also interesting to mention that, we will do the following that the webinar content will also be used, that means the material, not the webinar pieces itself, but the webinar, the webinar material. We will also use to feed the assistant that you can get the information also um, at your fingertips uh, when you need them um, um, in the use of the software, uh, actually at the point where you are. Anyway, so that's just some um, comments before. When we talk about detector and we like to talk about our revolution, our quantum leap in the use of detectors in virtual fusion, it's always important to start once more with a question about why do we physical optics? Because this detector revolution is absolutely benefiting from the usage of physical optics. We do physical optics just to repeat this very, very clearly, because we think that uh, future uh, proof software development must be based on, on the most sophisticated classical optics theory we have, and that is physical optics. And as uh, I discussed in the Wednesday webinars, um, it's always also very clear and important that general optics is a part of it. That means the decision in favor of physical optics is far away from being a decision against the middle optics. I would even say the opposite is true. The things come together in the most beautiful way. Now, for today, it's important that we get a, once more, once more I say because of the Wednesday webinars, that we have once more a look into what physical optics means. Physical optics means we are propagating electromagnetic fields through the system. Um, that means our E field and our H field, electromagnetic E and H, clear. And um, the electromagnetic fields, they are described, they are governed by Maxwell's equations. And that means all things which are important for optics and photonics are included in them um, if we don't go into the quantum optics regime. Now, that means in particular that the benefit of it of this comprehension of information of a field by maximum flexibility in inclusion of optical effects. You don't need to go through them now, but all the effects you can think of are included. Source modeling, that turns out to be important today also. Component modeling, it's uh, not so important today, but uh, um, of course, it's clear that physical optics gives here the maximum flexibility you can dream of. And detector modeling, because electromagnetic fields includes all the field, inf all the light information, all information about light you can think of. It means, of course, if that's true, then with an electromagnetic field in your detector, you can calculate any kind of detector function you might be interested in. So that is the topic of today, and it is very, very important to think first about source modeling a little bit in order to discuss detector modeling well. I just give you a hint. For example, in AR, VR, in augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, um, we use, for example, but also, for example, you know, in the pancake lens systems for VR, uh, but in the light light in particular, we use a lot of uh, um, light paths through the light guide. And at the end, you need to handle all of these different 
what you will see we call channel modes. And they come with a lot of input. You have some different colors uh, and uh, you have different um, angles, fields of view, uh, fields, etc. And these are all different fields which reach the detector. And of course, there is an issue of coherence. That means you need to be clear what of these modes are correlated. That's a term we are using here. And which modes are uncorrelated. This word correlated is a more, ap more statistical optics term. Um, often we also say coherent to correlated, but I prefer correlated and um, because it's more general. Anyway, in this talk, I will not talk about ultra short pulses. I can just say for anybody who's interested in ultra short pulses that in 23, very soon in 23, um, that means in the first half, uh, we will also extend the universe detector to maximum benefit in ultra short pulse modeling but uh, in the first version now we have in particular added techniques for stationary sources which are most sources that means anything which is not ultra short is in fact stationary that means the, any kind of light sources we are typically dealing with um, if it's uh, laser sources or if it's um, thermal lamp on led or led doesn't matter it's all stationary uh, ultra short pulses are only exception here Okay, so that means, and in if you have a stationary source, then we know that the source modes, that means all the modes which are generated by a source. For example, in imaging, you have a, each point of the object is a source mode, right? You can think like this. So it means any source, mo uh, source mode, uh, which is generated by the source models, they are uncorrelated. And, uh, and then they are propagated through the system. And this concept of modes which are correlated and uncorrelated, I'd like to discuss a little bit more in detail because our detectors must know that, okay? So that means if I'd like to discuss detectors, it's quite important that we have first a look into the source model, not in too much detail, but in the general mode concept. Maybe I give one more comment. If you do ray tracing, Monte Carlo ray tracing, for example, then the rays are typically considered as uh, carrying an amount of energy flux per ray, and that is all ended up, the fluxes are added up in the output. There's no chance to handle different types of correlation between the light, but all of these things are done neither uh, typically uncorrelated, that means all the energy are just and add up, or uh, sometimes also you can, at least for amplitudes, you can add up everything correlatedly, but this is already quite uh, uh, just a feature. It's not, you have not a mode source model where you distinguish between correlated and uncorrelated modes, but that's important. The reason is the following. If you have a source and you like to model a source, Okay, if you very often you just take one laser source, for example, and you assume there's just one mode and you have a Gaussian beam, it's, that is just one mode. That's it. But if you, for example, have a multi-mode laser, then you already have several lateral modes. If you have an extended source like an LED, you have several modes. If you do imaging with a field of view and you assume an incoherent illumination of your object, then you have uncorrelated lateral modes and so on. So it means we have the situation that we have uncorrelated lateral modes. Each mode, to make it very clear, that's sometimes confusing, but each mode is a fully coherent field. That means if you split this mode and then you superimpose it again, you get an interference pattern. That does it mean. So that means a fully coherent field, if you put it, for example, into a double slit, Young's interference experiment, then you get an interference pattern. That is a fully coherent field. It means each mode has just one wavelength, monochromatic, and is fully coherent. That's the reason uh, if you write that down, then you see there is a sine and cosine function included, and that's the reason why that is also called, and we often call it like that, a harmonic field mode. So that is what a mode is. Each mode consists of six field components, each mode. So E, X, E, Y, Z, H, X, H, Y, H, Z. So we have six field components. And we very often switch between the domains. So we also go into the K domain. So we have also six field components in the K domain. That's, a, well, that's one mode. 
So that's one mode. And that is what you can see now, in particular, in the universal detector, the new one, um, you can see that uh, we have here all these field components. You can switch on which you like to use in your detector. For example, you like to see it, but that is here just what is to be used for what's coming in the detector. And you can also say X domain or K domain or both. So you can ask for all of this and or all of this. That's what you can do in this kind of uh, detector setting. I'd like to mention to you, uh, that's important, EX and EY are always there. So, so they, if you click EY in addition to EX, there's no more numerical effort. If you click on EZ, HX, HY, HZ, and you don't need them, then you spend more computation time, even if you don't need it. So that is just a comment. Uh, each component in general requires a little bit more computation time in the detector only, not in the propagation, by the way, just in the detector. So, okay, so far to this. Now, each mode now comes, or each lateral mode comes with the power spectrum, if you have one, right? Can be just one wavelength, or the lateral mode is just a mode with one wavelength, but you need a power spectrum. So you need this mode in, more wavelength. So you need it more often because each mode is monochromatic. So it means if you like now to see uh, um, several wavelengths, then you need to do this mode more often. And that is what you need to do per mode. Mm, in ray tracing, it's the same, right? You have a angular dispersion uh, uh, um, um, distribution of rays. And if you like to have different wavelengths, you need to, to use this uh, once more. And probably it has another distribution, right? So that's uh, the same here uh, with modes. That means in your source plane, so that's the source here, the source model. And uh, how to do this depends on your source. Okay, how many lateral modes, what are the power spectrum, and so on. That depends all on your on your source model. And then you have in your source plane, which 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 lab starts the propagation. In the source plane, you have your source modes with the index MJ for lateral modes and for the frequency. It means, let's assume you have M lateral modes and J uh, sampling points in the in the power spectrum or just discrete RGB3 or so. Then you have M times J uncorrelated source modes. And because we do linear optics here, at least before we do some nonlinear optics in the system, but here we start with linear um, uh, system part, then you have M times J uncorrelated source modes, which are to be propagated through the system. And now comes the very, very exciting new feature, the source power management. That is very, very essential uh, because if you do more and more, for example, as we will see, radiometry and photometry detectors, it is, makes not so much sense uh, if you have not a proper power scaling. What is the situation? The situation is as follows all source modes, are generated by virtual lab with a normalized amplitude. And then, of course, there is an initial relative weight according to the source model. For example, if you have a multimode laser, not all the modes have the same weight. So you have different weights. But it starts with a normalization and then a weight. It means, which you have probably already seen often when you work with virtual lab, that if you calculate anything in power or even in, in, in field strength, the values can be quite small because the scaling, the normalization is a very low energy level. And uh, now we have added the following. If you are not interested in the power, it doesn't matter. But now we are interested in the power. Now we say the following. If you activate the source power management, then um, the virtual lab calculates for all the modes, so all these M times J modes, it calculates the power as it is with a standard normalized approach. And then you say, I like to have one watt or 10 watt or one kilowatt or whatever, one milliwatt. And then Virtual Lab scales automatically all the modes accordingly so that at the end you have the white power in your system um, uh, introduced. And then you can see how much which any kind of your detector, et cetera, et cetera, and then all the values are probably scaled. 
I also like to mention it, if you are not interested in, then don't use it, because it also takes a little bit time, of course, to calculate the power. It's not a lot, as you will see, uh, but anyway, as I like to say, it is not wise if you don't need a feature to use it, because any feature, of course, uh, there's some algorithm behind it. Now, this is the first demonstration now for Christian um, to show how this new exciting feature works. Thank you, Frank. I already share. No, I don't share yet. No, I share. Perfect. So, thank you, Frank. Very, very nice introduction of this uh, complete source uh, mode construct and concept we are implementing. Uh, let's have a look how uh, the source power management is realized in virtual uh, For demonstration purpose, I selected a quite easy setup. So I select a multi-mode Gaussian source, uh, which uh, is simply a source which generates a set of uh, Gaussian functions with different orders. So let's have a quick look uh, what is configured here. So I specified that, uh, that I like to have four modes. I gave all of them the same weight because this is not important now for this demonstration. Uh, the first mode, uh, the first mode uh, has an order of zero, 0, then comes zero, 01, then 10, and then 11. One, one. And for investigating the field of the light source, I use a universal detector. Uh, and let's do the simulation first without power management. So what is done by default in Virtual Lab? And if I perform the simulation, I get the following result. So this is the result of the E-field detector. I selected here only to show the X component. Uh, could also access all the other components. And if I see here now, this is my Gaussian shape of the first mode. I can go through the modes simply by clicking on the corresponding button in the ribbon. And everything is scaled uh, to a factor of one. So everything has uh, an amplitude with a maximum value of one. And then of course, uh, if you discuss about power management, it's of course somehow uh, also important to measure the power. Uh, that's the reason why I decided already to, to show you some of our add-on technology without explaining what is really behind it. And therefore, I simply go to the universal detector and activate an add-on which calculates the radiant flux. So let's keep everything on. Close this document because it will be generated again once more. Then I press perform the simulation. I get the same result as before. And in the logging uh, of the detector window, I get the value of the power. As you see, it's quite low. It's only some picowatt. And this comes because of the normalization, which was explained quite nicely by Frank. Um, and to activate now the power management, you have to go to the profile editor. The profile editor can be accessed by the ribbon of the optical setup. If you click here on Profile Editor, you have here a lot of parameters which are organized, and the power management is located in the section for the sources in the subcategory Power Management. Then I simply say I like to activate the power management, and let's select some value. Let's select maybe one watt, doesn't matter. I can enter here whatever I like. I can enter milliwatt, megawatt, nanowatt, whatever. Then I press OK to confirm the changes, and then I repeat the simulation. I repeat the simulation, and now we already see that the detector evaluates now that I have 1,000 milliwatt, one watt. Uh, so this is exactly what we configured here, and we also see the effect on the amplitude. So we see now that virtual lab calculated the weight which is respond, uh, which is necessary to scale the source field to a power of one watt, and these values are multiplied through all the modes. If they would have different weights, of course, uh, the maxima would be always a little bit different. Uh, and this is handled completely internally. Okay, finally, let's have a look at the logging, because as Frank mentioned, uh, <clears throat> the power management is always done initially before we do such a simulation. So when we uh, start a simulation and the power management is activated, which lab evalu evaluates uh, the power of the source and then calculate the scaling factor. And in the logging, you directly can see when the power management is done, so directly before the uh, concrete simulation, and you also see which time uh, was used for this. In case you have not activated the power management, this uh, messages in the, in the logging will not appear. 
Okay, as you see, it's uh, quite easy. Uh, so I would say there's not uh, many things to show more. Uh, I can already spoil a little bit for uh, some further uh, demonstration I will give later. Uh, I will also show how nicely and easy it is to use it. Uh, and to that, I would give back the word to Frank for further discussion in the talk. And then we see uh, each other back again in the next demonstration. Good, good. Very nice. Uh, by the way, here, so uh, let the power management don't take any significant time at all. If you just have four modes, if you have hundreds and hundreds of modes, then it could be, of course, a little bit different. Anyway, so it means the time is not an issue here, really, but uh, I'd just like to mention uh, what I mentioned with, if you use an algorithm that you don't need, that's always not a good idea in, if you use a software, but here it was not an issue. Good, now, now that was now beyond the source plane. In the source plane, we have now our modes, uh, our, what we call source modes, and if we um, have a stationary source, as we typically have, a stationary one, then the modes are uncorrelated and um, good now now the modes are propagated through the system and then we have a non sequential system modeling that is what we always have uh, dependent on your channel configuration of course and uh, there's still a microphone again on and um, uh, so we have this non-sequential uh, system modeling, and that also means um, that includes possible splits of the source modes into mutually correlated modes. That's what I said before. Uh, it means, for example, if you have a virtual lab and you use, uh, for example, lens system, and you do some non-sequential modeling by allowing some reflections, and so these modes, which are generated by that, they are all mutually correlated because they are from one source mode. A bit confusing, but just think about, um, this is one mode, one fully coherent mode. If it's split, then they are correlated. Good, so, and that means we have this, um, uh, this comes from the channels, from the channel configuration. So that's the reason why we refer to them as channel modes. It means at the end, we have source modes, which are uncorrelated, and each source mode might be, it's not needed, but it might be split into some number n, which depends on the mode where the light goes through and we don't know before where the light really goes through and how often it is reflected and transmitted and so on, so we don't know. Um, uh, that means we have some specific number per source mode in which the source mode can be split into mutually correlated channel modes. And they all reach detector. So that means at the end, we have three indexes and the, in the detector that are the lateral modes. The lateral modes are split into wavelengths or vice versa, the wavelengths are split into the M. You can see it this way or this way, depends on what you like to do. Um, and then we have a per source mode a split into mutually correlated channel modes. These channel modes are responsible for the interference effects or speckle effects, right? Um, um, that's very important to understand. Uh, so that means this is here what we have. Good. Um, I now put this here away because I need a little bit more place. So I put this to here. So that means I like to uh, illustrate it as follows. My source generates lateral modes. Lateral modes comes with the power spectrum sampling. Maybe you have just one mode M and just the power spectrum, or you have just one lambda per mode, so that can be, or you have just like a Gaussian laser beam, just one lateral mode and one wavelength. And then you have that, you don't have this split, then maybe an interferometry, you have this one time, this one time, so it's one mode, one times one, one mode, is one index, one, one, and that is split into the different non-sequential channels, which are then interfering, uh, superimposing, and to do the interference, right? But if you have, for example, have partially, interference, or you have uh, um, uh, any kind of uh, uh, interference experiment with a stationary source, so white light interferometry or something, then of course, white light interferometry, for example, would be one mode here, but then we have here a power spectrum, and then you have the split per mode, and then all these different interference patterns are overlapping, and they give you exactly what you would measure in a lab, right? So that means this it helps you a lot 
Um, and by this, you see why in physical optics, we have this powerful chance to do very, very good source modeling, because this is the concept we have in the background. Now, this collection of modes, more or less, depends on what application you have and what you are modeling. This collection of modes is now reaching the detector plane or surface, but actually we have pens. And now each detector must be, of course, each detector must be enabled to deal with the three types of different modes. And our Geneva detector now can that do very well. Um, that means we have this mutually ungraded lateral source modes, M. We have per mode, we have the spectral modes per lateral mode, also uncorrelated. So it means all the source modes here are uncorrelated, as I said several times now. And uh, each source mode can be split into mutually correlated channel modes. That's the situation. With this now, the universal detector can measure everything you like. Partial coherence even, and so on. So it can uh, measure everything you like. If you know the physics to calculate it, of course, that means we can only calculate things from a lab where also there is a good physical model. What does it mean, right? And that is sometimes um, can be complicated, but it's not a big, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a um, game stopper. Uh, it's, it's it always works. It's just a question of knowing the physics well. And uh, as a user, you don't need to care about it. Uh, that is what we are doing for you. And if you know things better than we, then you can program, of course, that yourself. Um, because that is what Christian also will show. Um, this is, of course, completely customizable. It means if you have your own detector, you like to program knowing this mode concept, which comes from coherence theory, by the way. Um, if you have this mode concept, which comes from coherence theory, and you are expert in this, then you can also program everything yourself to evaluate any function you like to do here. Now, now comes the universal detector into the game. The universal detector, first of all, detects all these modes. It means the general detector gives full access to the electromagnetic field components of all modes. That's what the general detector is doing as a first step, as a prerequisite for all what's coming then. And that's what you already saw. Uh, we have here our um, field components. Christian will show that a little bit more now. And then you have here. Okay, here's applied practical approximation for component calculation. This is something also new now. If you do have, if you have Parkser light, in fact, that works quite often very well here. Um, if you have Parkser light, then uh, the calculation of EZ, H, X, H, Y, and H, Z don't need any extra time. That means then if you have EX and EY, then the rest follows mathematically much, much, much more straightforwardly. And um, this will be also discussed in the assistant to explain you why. And that gives you also a hint when to use it or not. So um, here in this picture, I, I said yes. But if you have non parallel optics, high and A stuff, if you can have a rule of thumb, if your detector is positioned in a high and A region of the system, then no. Otherwise, else you can do yes about that. And as always, if you do an approximation, because that's an approximation, um, it is always wise at the end before you publish something that you switch on no to see if there's any change, right? Uh, then you have saved time to calculate things faster. But at the end, you can check once more that everything is uh, rigorously uh, the same and the approximation were reasonable. Anyway, here you see also what are these mutually correlated modes, these channel modes? It means this is sum of mutually coherent modes or correlated modes, or we could also say channel modes, right? So these are the channel modes. And the universal detector allows you to make a decision if you like to see them already add up. That means you like to see the interference patterns already, or if you don't like to see the interference pattern, but the channel modes separately. That is possible to say here. And also here we have some feature how to add them up to make it even more flexible. But that is a, the default setting here. And now, Chris, I will show you more about how this looks like and this works. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> okay, in this demonstration, I will show, let's say, the basic features, uh, all the basic features of the universal detector. Uh, and I decided to have two different systems for the discussion of the features. 
In the first system, I like to discuss exactly what uh, Frank mentioned before. So the, the access to the, to the source mode, also the access to Grittles data, which is also possible with a universal detector, and also to the coherent uh, combination of these coherent channel modes. And in the second system, I like to show you uh, something in addition, like the positioning, like evaluation of also polarization ellipses, which is also a quite nice feature. So let's start with uh, a quite say, popular or famous uh, example of our knowledge base, which is the Michelson interferometer. So uh, it is a sphere wave, which is collimated by some lens system. And then we have two passes. Uh, which uh, are illuminating in plain mirror. One is a little bit tilted, and then finally we like to evaluate the uh, field which illuminates uh, the detector at a specific position. So what we do here is uh, complete non-sequential modeling, and we directly have now a situation with, which Frank introduced. So uh, the, due to the non-sequential nature of the system, we have now several channel modes which are illuminating the is a universal detector. Okay, at the beginning, let's have a look what we have uh, for parameters uh, in the universal detector. So, uh, of course, we have our standard stuff. So, we have the coordinate system, the position stuff, and the free space propagation. I will not go to, into detail about this. And on the detector parameters page, we have here five tab pages. Uh, on the first page, you see the feed quantity selection. I will say something to this also in the second demonstration. Then you can specify the detector window in X and K domain. And what I like to discuss now is the access of critters data. Uh, in the webinar from yesterday, we discussed already that if you have pointwise sequences, uh, then it is possible, of course, to extract the information also uh, from a pointwise uh, point of view. And in the universal detector, you can easily activate this option. This is done by simply selecting here that you like to see the results without interpolation. And here you can already decide, uh, decide something quite interesting. You can decide whether you like to see only the positions, the directions and the wavefront phase, or whether you like to see also the field values. This is a result which are typically used uh, from, from ray optical uh, software tools. Uh, and let's do so first the uh, simulation of this uh, interferometer setup and only extract the information of the position, direction, and wavefront phase. If we do so, we get such a result. This is a dot diagram, and here on the in the ribbon we already see that we have access through the three indices Frank mentioned. Of course, uh, in this configuration, I had only one wavelength. I had also only one incoherent source mode, but of course I have, because of the, of the system, I already have two channel modes. And I can easily switch between them, even for this ray information. So this is, so this is a, a information which is a ray optical result, but even here we have this mode structure encoded. So I can switch between the modes, and then you see, okay, the points are a little bit shifted, but you also get access to the to the wavefront phase, for example, here. And if I investigate the wavefront phase, let's use another color table. Maybe we use, let's use hot color. And then you see, uh, this is more or less a plane wave. So a little bit uh, wavefront is on it, but it's quite small. And if we change it, we see already here that we have some different phases which are illuminating uh, the detector. Okay, let's go to Critless data, but with field values. Performing the simulation once more. And then you see here nicely that you can also switch through the modes. So this is the X component of the first mode. This is the EY component of the second, uh, this is the X component of the second mode. And here you can switch between the uh, different components of the, of, the, of the electromagnetic field. I selected here in the detector only to show the EX, EY, EZ, EZ component. So I see here, this is the X, this is the EY component, and this is the EZ component. Okay. In addition, of course, the universal detector is also capable not only to show the points, but also to show the points, including some interpolation. And this we refer to credit data. 
And if I perform now the simulation once more, I get the same information as before, but not as a point cloud with field information, but with uh, an interpolated version of it. So I have also access to the X, Y, Z uh, field for the both modes. Okay, so finally, let's come to the coherent summation. If I activate this flag and perform the simulation now once more, now both modes are summed up coherently and I see nicely or in my nice interference pattern, which I am of course expecting from this kind of uh, interference experiment. Okay, so far to the Critlist data and to this coherent summation stuff. Let's close uh, this stuff uh, for the demonstration now. And let's have a look at another system I prepared. And this is uh, also quite easy setup. So I decided to use some donut mode, which illuminates the spherical wave and I like to investigate the field in the focal region of this spherical lens. And also for this, I use a universal detector. <coughs> I can simply perform the simulation. And here I get nicely the EX, the EY, and the EZ component. As you can see, maybe it's not obvious because the color lookup table is encoding it in a, in a dynamic way. If you see here, for example, you have a, a magnitude of 48 volt per meter, and the EZ component is only one, so it's quite small. And this is exactly what Frank explained before. So if I activate now the paraxial assumption flag uh, in the detector and say I like to apply the paraxial assumption, then the EZ component is calculated not by full transformation, but by simplified formulas, which is in this case that it's simply set to zero. Let's perform the simulation more. And then you see nicely, the simulation is now faster. Okay, it was fast even before. But uh, because of the EZ component is now done by this uh, approximation we introduced by setting this flag, uh, we get now this information, which would fit quite well for further investigations. Okay, let's deactivate this flag uh, uh, again. And let's have a look on the field quantities, which uh, shall be calculated by the detectors. So currently, it was specified uh, the detector should calculate the EX, EY, EZ component and the HX, HY, HZ component were de deactivated. I can easily activate them, and now the detector will calculate these components. Um, but we make a difference here between calculates components and showing the components. The activates that they are also shown, I need to go in the few settings of the electromagnetic field quantization add-on, add to add-on, I will say something later. And then I can select here that I also like to have the complete E field information displayed. And if I perform now my simulation, of course it takes a little bit longer, but as you can see, it is not really drastically. Uh, you see the X component, the Y component, the Z component, and you have also access to the HX, HY, HZ component, which looks quite interesting in this case. Okay, the next thing I like to show is also a new feature which was introduced uh, with the new version 2023.1, and this is the evaluation of polarization ellipses. This can be activated also in this electromagnetic field quantity visualization settings by simply selecting, I like to show the polarization ellipses. Then I activate this flag and I can select uh, the plane for which I like to evaluate the polarization ellipses. So let's stay with the H, uh, X, Y plane, but I can also select the Y, Z plane or the C, X plane. Uh, in this dialog, I have also already access to customize the visualization of the ellipses, but let's stay with the defaults. Uh, press OK, OK. And then I get the same information as I get before, but with a graphic add-on. So uh, the polarization we have here uh, are called in virtual lab a graphic add-on. So, which means we have the 2D data array in the backbone, and the polarization ellipses are drawn as an add-on to the view. Let's customize this a little bit. So maybe we go to the black-white lookup table for the visualization of the amplitude. And now we see the, the polarization ellipses quite nicely. We can also customize the view of it. So let's have a quick look. Uh, on the few settings here. So for example, I'm uh, able to 
uh, indicates the direction of the colonization in the polarization ellipsis by some arrows. I can customize the colors. So let's, for example, use uh, yellow for clockwise and maybe green for counterclockwise. And I can also select the density which should be used for the visualization of the polarization ellipsis. Then I press here, so I select here 20, and then I select OK. And then it is adapted in a quiz night way, quiz night way. Um, yeah, well, and then this gives you, of course, information about the local behavior of this uh, polarization in this con uh, con uh, specific detector result. Good. <clears throat> Let's have a look what we have uh, in addition to this uh, parameters I mentioned already. So nearly all of this uh, I already mentioned. Let's have a look in the K domain. As Frank mentioned or, and explained, uh, if the universal detector provides information in the X domain as well as in the K domain, so I can activate it. Here we have the same logic as before. If I activate it here, it does not mean that it's automatically shown. So therefore, I say now, uh, I go in the edit dialog of the electromagnetic field quantity visualizations again. I select, I, se I select that I only like to see the Fourier domain or the K domain. I don't like to see the X domain now. I press OK. I close the dialog. I perform the simulation once more. And now I can get nicely the field in the X domain. Let's go back again to the black and white color. And you see here nicely, we are now in the K domain. So this is uh, indicated by two things. First thing is, of course, the coordinates are given in one over meter. And the other information is uh, here. You see also in the caption of the document, you see that the information is given in the K domain. OK. Then uh, for further discussion, uh, let's go back to the X domain. Uh, and have a look at the detector window. We have two detector windows which can be specified, one for X and one for K domain. The settings are equivalent, so it's possible to specify the same parameters for the X and the K domain independently, of course, because they live also on different parameters, uh, on different coordinates. Um, and the first thing which I like to show is uh, the configuration of the window size. So first of all, you can specify that you like to evaluate uh, the window size or that the window size should be uh, for the detector should be concluded from the field data. Uh, this you can also adapt with some, some scaling factors. And if you do so, then you get the information which is used by which you have to propagate the field to the detector. So this is the size which uh, is used for calculation. Uh, but it's often the case, or especially I am often customizing this uh, to have a nicer adaption of the view and to show more what is important. Then you switch from here in the detector window, X domain in my case, to a manual setting. And then you say you like to have uh, maybe 100 micrometers by 100 micrometers. And if you do so, then of course you get the smaller field. Okay, the last parameter I may like to mention here is, uh, of course, the sampling. We show uh, credit data, which means we need to specify, uh, at least it has to be specified on which grid we like to see the stuff. Also here we have the option that we like to uh, use the resolution, so the grid, uh, from the input data, or whether we like to set it manually. If we like to set it manually, we have the option to set a grid period or to set a number of points. Default uh, is always to specify a number of points because it's quite typical for a detector, I would say. Um, and for the point specification, you have initially a list where you can select between some standard resolutions uh, and to show you that it's, this has also an effect. Uh, I like to use here a user-defined specification and let's say we like to have it now on a grid of 301 by 301 data points. So we specify here now manually that we like to have it on a window size of 100 micrometer by 100 micrometer with 301 by 301 pixels. And if I perform the simulation again, I get nicely here also the information, in the property browser, if I check it here. So this was the initial result from the first simulation that it's 512 by 512. And if I change here, I see 
the number of pixels is adapted. Okay, the last tab page uh, I did not mention in this presentation. I also will not uh, explain uh, now in detail. This will be uh, done in the next presentation. Is the add-on page, um, and therefore we will also use the system. So, but before we do this, uh, I think Frank will some uh, say some words to the concept of the add-ons and also to the ideas Stay behind in. it. Yeah, stay in. I I like to ask you to show one one thing more, uh, two things more. Can you go open the general detector again? Of course. Okay, so um, go to the window, the window X domain. Okay, uh, I like to emphasize this uh, very uh, upper line that is um, the position. Uh, maybe you have uh, some kind of modes which have different positions. Uh, I think that's also a new feature we have here in the version that if the modes have different positions, then you can now center of field mode. That means each window of a mode is centered around the center of this mode. Um, and that's very, very important. If you go to detector position, all are shown in the same window. That means they are shown with its relative position to each other. Uh, I think that's very, very important because in the past it was not like that. Uh, and then I'd like to show you one thing more, which is field quantities. Um, and then uh, show the field. Yes, here we have now for amplitude and phase, we have new options. And these options are, you have the amplitude as before, then you have the amplitude phase without the wavefront phase, which uh, I discussed yesterday, so in the Wednesday webinars uh, extensively. Then you can show the wavefront phase and what we have added now, which is also very important, we can exclude the spherical part. Um, this comes in particular when I work with my students, uh, uh, then they typically show me some aberrated wavefront phase, which is shaping light, but they show me the full thing. Then I don't see anything. Then I always ask them, please put the spherical wave away that I see the aberrations only. And that is now also included, which is extremely helpful uh, to show um, the things in a straightforward, easier way. It was also possible in the past to select then to remove the spherical phase, but now we have the option to do it in a fast and automatic way. So anyway, that was uh, uh, anyway a great, presentation of the features we have. So Thank I you. take over, my pleasure. Good. Good, and now let's uh, come to the real revolution, the real one. Now, we have full access to the electromagnetic components of all modes, that's what you saw. We can do it on gridded uh, uh, sampling points and gridless sampling points. We can add them up, the correlated modes and so on. So we can do all these things. And that gives us a chance to now calculate any detector function we like. From the modes, we can calculate any function we like. Now, that means we can deal with all the needs we have. That is the important thing. Now, up to now, before this new version, we had the following concept. Detector came with a specific function, for example, intensity or field size, that means beam size maybe even, um, and uh, such kind of things, or color view or something like this. Um, and a lot of also detectors uh, were not there. No? So well, we have PSF, MTF calculation, for example, also beam parameters we had, aberrations we could calculate, but all in different uh, things, photometry, radiometry was not included yet, right? So, and so that was a way to do. That means if you calculate, for example, aberrations and intensity and some other quantity in the same plane from the same field, then you need to introduce different detectors for that. And virtual lab need to propagate from the last component to this detector all the time. And if you need all the field components, it must do it all the time the same. This is of course, not the perfect way to do it. That was obvious to us. And then with this version now, we decided to make it much, much, much better. Now we do the following. We calculate the general detector at one position just one time. That's the reason why it's called universal detector, because it provides all the field information we need to calculate any type of detector. The only thing we need to do now, only with, uh, um, question, uh, not with parentheses here, in parentheses, uh, the, uh, the thing we need to do now is to calculate from the field 
the detector functions. But that's of course possible because the field includes all information about the field, at least on the grid on which we are working, the grid we have selected. Of course, the grid we selected is also um, um, the grid which we can now use for calculating more. And that's what we do now in a post-processing step, independent of the whole system simulation. The general detector gives us all information. Now we can apply any detector we like as a post-processing of the electromagnetic field data. And that's what we call detector add-ons. So that means each detector here can be an add-on. And that is what we really think it's a major breakthrough also because this result of the general detector can be stored and Christian will show that. And then you can apply this add-ons also afterwards, after all the simulation is done. You can investigate your field with any detector you like afterwards as somebody who is doing an experiment in the lab and gives the result to another team doing the investigation of the result. That's now possible. Somebody is calculating the field and then gives the field to another team and the field can now make a full diagnostic of this field uh, with all the detectors they are interested in. And we were asked already in one of the former webinars, I think in the Monday webinar sometime, we were asked uh, if we also will provide in the future that this general detector result can be used as a source in a further modeling, for example, for parameter one of another detector. Add on, the answer is yes, we will. We don't have now in the version, but it will come definitely in 23. So that means this is what we think it's a major breakthrough. And that is what Christian will show um, soon how this works. That means the add on page. Christian has discussed the other ones. The add-on page uh, provides all the fields which you have selected that it should be provided. You did that in the field quantity tab. There you have selected what your detectors should know, should get, I have to say, because they need to know it. And so in the general case, you take it all, right? You take EX, EY, EZ, HX, HY, HZ. But uh, the detector add-ons in our description say you what is needed, so you can, you can check that. Anyway, and then you have this segment field quantities, which is the first add-on, which is used to show you the field values, which Christian has already used. And then you can calculate different quantities, like pointing back to intensity, irradiance, illuminance, intent. that is just a selection. Christian will show that can be completely customized here. So that's your choice what you put together. And with the version now, we already come with some of them. And, um, you can load them just so you have access to this uh, selection of different types of add-ons. You see all the radiometry quantities, uh, photometry quantities, different extent measures. So any any extent uh, can be measured. And also here's something special we will show at the end of the webinar today. And then you can use them here. That means uh, we have already add this. And uh, more detector add-ons are provided steadily. So we are working on that in this continuous way. Uh, and uh, most important, they can be given to you as a user, independent of the releases, because we can add them. And then you can refresh via the internet, you can refresh this folder here, and then you get all the new stuff we have done, you get automatically and can load it. Um, that means we can provide you with new detectors in a very, very easy way and provide it to the community. And of course, as an experienced user, you can also um, develop your own add-ons, right? You can do a new one and develop it yourself. That means in the future, if you miss a detector, uh, then you send always a mail, of course, to our great support team. Uh, but in the future, you will see that we can provide you with uh, the missing detectors much faster because we don't need to wait for the next release. We can do it before, if everything is well-defined, of course. It's always a question. Uh, if we, if the support team gets some questions, we can do the answers as fast as you, the problem is well stated. That's always the same, of course. And that's the same for detectors also. Now, let's talk a little bit. I just like to give you a sneak peek into the physics. Just a sneak peek that you understand when I'm saying the field gives me all information. Okay, let's have a look in radiometry and photometry. And I like to use that because this is often understood as a domain of ray optics. Because in the textbooks, of course, radiometry and photometry is defined 
somehow related to ray optics. Um, and if you read some book about radiometry and photometry, I guess you would agree with me the descriptions with all these solid angles and so on, that is sometimes a little bit confusing, I would say. But anyway, um, it is, uh, uh, of course, a formulation which is completely based on, uh, on, on, on ray optics. And there was, um, there was a question, I, I know that from an internal discussion by Emil Wolf. Emil Wolf asked his students some, some, some time ago. Uh, uh, he's not living anymore, so that means, of course, uh, but he did it when he worked with his uh, very early PhD students, even um, Ari Freiberg was still a PhD student in his team. Uh, he was involved in this question and published also papers and afterwards. Uh, Emil Ruf asked this very, very interesting question to his students. Does radiometry quantities and photometry quantities, or radiometry quantities he, he concentrated on, the rest is then trivial, uh, is radiometry quantities, are they also well-defined in physical optics? That's a very interesting question because it should be, right? Because general optics is included. But of course, it could be that in general optics, we do some assumptions which are not easy to uh, generalize in physical optics. Uh, the answer from my side and also from uh, this research was it is no problem whatsoever. The only quantity which makes a little bit trouble is the radiance. Um, and that uh, is because uh, radiance is a, is a term I also think in the, in the community which is specialized on this. It's always a question of the resolution where the light comes locally from. And this is something uh, which is a little bit uh, more tricky, but it's also definitely possible, no doubts. Uh, but that is the reason why we have not edited yet. No, that's not the reason. The reason is that the few of the radians is a four-dimensional quantity. That means I have uh, two directions, right? I have input direction and output directions. And we, the few for that is not ready, but it's uh, on the work. Uh, and we will have this few soon. And then we can also do this very, very nicely. So it means physical optics can do all of this. And now I'd like to show you radiometry data, how that works. You don't need to understand it. You don't need to do it. It's done. But I'd like to give you at least a chance for the background. The major quantity, if you deal with the radiometry in physical optics, is an energy quantity. And the energy quantity, we have two quantities in physical optics. is a pointing vector and the energy density. Both quantities follow from Maxwell's equations. There's a special procedure. Um, you can find in advanced physical optics books uh, how to derive that from Maxwell's equations. But the Maxwell's equations gives an energy conservation law equation, which is follows from Maxwell's equations. And if you study this energy conservation, then you can identify the pointy vector, which is a flux, um, uh, flux density, is an energy flux density, watt per square meter, and the energy density. And of course, Conservation of energy is something about how much flux you have outside of a volume and the change of the energy density in the volume. And this is discussed in the context of, um, uh, of, of uh, physical optics in a very nice way. And then you get a result. And here it's for harmonic field modes. That's not a general equation here. That's for harmonic field modes. It means uh, our, one of our source modes. And for one of our source modes, it can be shown that the relationship between the field and the pointing vector, vector, three components here um, are given by this. That looks a little bit, it's a cross product, right? It's uh, E cross H, uh, just component wise written. And um, this is, looks a little bit complicated maybe uh, for people who are not so familiar with the cross product, uh, but it's a pointless operation. It's a super fast operation. If you have the E field and the H field on the grid at different positions, you can calculate it super fast, right? There's no, problem. That means when we have the field values, we have access to the pointing vector. And here you see, if your pixel optics, then the HZ is zero and the EZ is zero. Then, for example, EX is uh, zero, then EY is zero. And then we have the typical situation that the flow is just in the Z direction. But that is just for pixel light and non pixel light not. So this is a fast operation. And now comes an important thing. I always also discuss with students a lot about that. This is a non-linear uh, non equation because EX and, e and H are multiplied. It means the fields are multiplied. If fields are multiplied, it's non-linear. And that means the sum, the correlated sum, they must be done before. 
It means if I like to calculate the pointing vector, I can do per mode, but that's not per correlated mode, per channel mode, but that is just a pointing vector of a channel mode I can do. But if I like to calculate more of this whole field, then I need to sum it up. And that is what our detectors are doing. So they sum it up and then I have my pointing vector per source mode. That's important. So it means per source mode. Good. Now, that's a platform, the pointing vector. I have that now. And now I like to calculate, for example, the intensity. The intensity per source mode. The intensity per source mode, or the intensity in general, it's a term which is used quite as a jargon in the optics community. If you ask people, what's the intensity? I would say, some people think the radiant intensity, some people think another intensity. It's not an easy thing what people really think what the intensity is. And um, some people say u to the power of two, whatever this u is. And uh, so that means intensity is a term which is used widely without a very clear definition. That's the reason why we are using a very clear definition, which is given by born wolf in Principle of Optics, which is that the intensity is given as the magnitude, the norm, the length of the pointing vector. That's uh, intensity according to born wolf and that's what we are doing. And to emphasize that, I do a BW here for born wolf So that's the intensity. It's not an official radiant quantity, right? Um, uh, it, it is the intensity. So if I do that, if I sum it up over the modes, the M modes, that means the lateral modes for one wavelength, then I get the spectral intensity, which is typically uh, noted by giving a lambda here to the um, to the index, right? And this spectral intensity has then it's per per wavelength, watt per square meter per meter because per wavelength per meter. And if I integrate now over lambda, that means now we integrate over our spectral modes, the other modes in the source, then we get the intensity. Then we get intensity, which is then integration over lambda, then one M is way here. So we get finally that that is watt per square meter. That's of course a unit of the pointing vector because it's a length of the pointing vector, so that's clear. Uh, here, uh, this unit is obviously not per lambda. Anyway, so it means we have the intensity which is given. This is shown as all uh, radiant-related, uh, energy-related quantities um, uh, in the radiant view. And uh, Christian will show that. The radiant view has the option to show the spectral quantities and the integrated quantities. And the integrated quantities in false color or in the um, human eye perception view to see the colorimetry uh, in colors. You will see and, um, uh, how we do that. Now, let's come to the, the irradiance, just to give you a, two, uh, three examples. Let's go to the irradiance. The irradiance per source mode on a surface. So you have a surface, curved one or plain one. And on the surface, the irradiance is defined as the energy flux through the surface and project it on the normal vector of the surface. That's a definition also in ray optics. Everything is the same, right? All this is always the same. I just formulated these, these definitions are completely in accordance with uh, the ray optical also. Um, the ray optical situation is according to the Wednesday webinars, uh, just a special case of physical optics and it can be nicely derived um, to show the, that the results are all the same. But in physical optics, I'm, I'm more general because I can also calculate these things in planes where the ray optical thing is not allowed. So it means we are here more general. Anyway, the pointing vector times the local position uh, at the position where we are, uh, the local direction of the surface gives the irradiance on the surface or through the surface, say it this way. Uh, that means it's a flux through the surface. And that's always a component uh, in the direction of the surface. Good. And if I now again sum over the lateral modes, the source modes, uh, which are the same wavelength, then I get again my spectral irradiance, same unit as, same dimension as the, as the intensity. That's the reason why people often take, don't care about irradiance intensity or so, but different definition. Um, and then if I integrate further, I get the, um, uh, of course, the, the irradiance, the general irradiance, EE watt per square meter. Again, this is shown in the radiant view in Virtual Lab. Now, let's just have a look to photometry at that example, just this example, to show you what's going on. 
the photometry is always related to the radiometric data. We have always couples, right? Irradiance to illuminance, um, radiant energy density to luminous energy density, and so on. So it's all all couples. And this coupling is very trivial, in fact. In uh, in radiometry, if you calculate uh, the integration over lambda, you don't need to do it, by the way, of course, uh, but you can do it. Um, then we just integrate it with the weights which are there. In photometry, we don't do it just by integrating over lambda, but we integrate it with the luminous efficiency function B lambda. Because we like to, in photometry, we don't like to uh, consider the physical power, the, the energy quantity, but we like to see how human beings are um, getting that into the eye. So what, what, what are differences in the brightness, right, for the human consideration? And colorimetry is the color human perception. It's a brightness human perception thinking. And uh, yeah, and this V lambda in our current version, you give for, for the photopic and the scotopic case, that means for night and day. There's also the mesopic case. It's a little bit more tricky to define. Uh, there are different, different options. Uh, we still think about how to do that uh, in a nice way. Um, it's not so well defined in literature, I would say. There are different options by different communities. It's more an, uh, a standardization problem. It's not a equation problem at all. Uh, it's more what kind of standards we are using and how to communicate that. But photopic and scotopic are clear. They have well-defined V lambdas and that's it. Okay, and then this VO is replacing as a constant, which is replacing the watt by lumen. That's just a, just the scaling. And that means all quantities in radiometry are replaced by quantities with lumen. It means instead of watt per square meter, we have lumen per square meter, which is also called lux. Okay, so it means uh, that's very clear. Now, these results, these photometry results, which is for all radiometric quantities, the same logic. These results are now not shown in the radiant view, of course, because we have no, um, we have an integration which is special, not just an integration as in radiometry, and we have no color view. We have no human perception color view because we integrate over the color already and we just show the brightness to the human being. So that's shown in the data view. And now to the end, just to show you another basic quantity which comes from Maxwell's equations directly from this energy conservation discussion, as I mentioned before. The electric energy density per source mode um, uh, is given by this formula that can be already derived. Don't need to care about it now. You see here comes really the typical thinking of Ex to the power of two plus Ey to the power of two plus Ey Z to the power of two. Here it comes, and for the magnetic field also. It means this typical square sums we are dealing often with in our discussion are the energy densities, not intensity or something like this, energy densities. And the radiant energy density per mode is given by the sum of this. And then we can again integrate over it, and we have the spectral valent energy density, joule per meter to the power of four, because per lambda. And if you integrate over the lambda, we get the valent energy density, joule per volume here. And that again can be shown in the radiant view, because we can see again the integration and the color, human eye color perception. Good. So here you see how that then works. It means we start with the universe detector. We have the electron field quantities to show what we like to see. Then I calculate the pointing vector. The pointing vector is the basis for the intensity. The intensity uh, um, uh, can be calculated from the pointing vector. The irradiance can be calculated from the pointing vector. And the illuminance is calculated from the irradiance. You see here very nicely the structure, how this is related. The radiant energy, the radiant energy is again calculated from the field. So that's exactly what you do. And Christian will now show that in much more detail, but anyway, that is what we already provide, and we have a full agenda to add more uh, quantities here. Before Christian shows his example, I'd like to show you a very exotic example, but just to make a little bit of point. Um, and um, so this is going like the following. I have a Gaussian beam, linear polarized, and I focus a beam here with the ideal lens. And I like to see here in the focal plane, uh, detector, E-field, pointing vector, energy density, irradiance, and intensity. I discussed them before. And we do it for a very small NA, so very Paxa light, and a very big NA, 
that means very non light. So here you see the E field. That's the E field, as Christian has shown before also, uh, but just squared, so that you can compare easier. And here are the amplitudes of the pointing vector. Um, as several times uh, mentioned, they have all different scaling. That's a parallel light. So if you scale them all the same, then you see all these components are not important. The EX component is the only important one. The Z component in particular is not uh, really high. Uh, the Y component is not there because uh, we have an ideal lens. There is no Y component. It was X-polarized light. And the pointing vector, as I mentioned before, just goes into Z direction. That's exactly what we assume. Parkser light has an energy flow in Z direction along the axis. That's what you see here, right? And if you now calculate the energy density, okay, the energy density is a square sum of the E vector. That's just this one. That's the intensity, the energy density. The irradiance is the SZ, that's this one. And the intensity is the magnitude of this one. It's also this one. You see, in Parkser optics, that's all the same. That's the reason why the books are so inaccurate in that. That means the discussions in the literature are horribly inaccurate because in parallel optics, it's all the same. You don't need to care. You can audit intensity uh, because it's all looking the same. But in non parallel optics, it's not the same. Then, of course, now you have here the EX. You have no EY again because X polarized light. And you have now a strong EZ. And then you can calculate a pointing vector, and it turns out to be looking like this. There's still a major contribution in that direction, even then. It follows from some kind of, um, if you look to the terms and you look a little bit more accurately to this, then you see it. But now, of course, you see that here are no contributions. This sum gives the energy density. The length of the EZ vector is still this, and the Z component is still this. That means the energy density looks now differently than the both other terms. Irradiant intensity looks the same, but the energy density looks quite differently. And if I go into the far field of this non parallel case, then again, the same situation. I don't go into the details here now. Um, and that is here now a quite different situation because now a lot of light goes into the X direction because you are in the far field. Um, and then you have much bigger contribution here. And now you have a different situation. You have energy density is this. Irradiance looks here. And now intensity and energy density are looking the same. So you see, it is good to know that virtual lab can handle these things in a rigorous way. Because if you are not working in the Parkside world, things are quite different. And that is always a point I like to emphasize if I talk with people doing material processing. Not to talk, talk about ultra-short pulses. There's even things are even more complicated. But if you do, and we will come with um, all these detectors for um, uh, pulses also, it means all the energy and uh, irradiances and so on uh, can be also, um, um, the fluxes at least can also be discussed for ultra-short pulses. And that's quite interesting to see then how then the things are going. Anyway, what I'd like to emphasize is if you're doing, for example, laser material processing, and you would like to do um, um, or any kind of other things where you are working with very high numerical aperture because you like to have very teeny spots. It's really a question, what is the process? On which is the process working? Is it working on the energy flux, the irradiance, or the energy density, which is the photon counter? The energy density is proportional to the number of photons. Irradiance is proportional to the flux of the photons through the material. Um, so that means it's a little bit of a question, what is going on? And I think that's very, very important that uh, we have a more discussion about it, about this vectoral nature of light in focal regions of Y and A apertures. I just like to mention it here. And now we have in Virtual Lab the platform to do all of these things because we can calculate all these different uh, quantities. And now I give uh, the floor to Christian Beck. Thank you very much, Frank, <clears throat> for this nice introduction of the add-ons and i really must say uh, that i was really looking forward for this demonstration because first of all i like the idea which was introduced by frank before and the second thing i think we already uh, did uh, quite a nice job that we developed a very nice user interface also to to have a very good user experience uh, when applying and using these add-ons Okay, for demonstration purpose, uh, I select the same system as we used in the first discussion. So this is the focusing of the donut mode. 
let's repeat the simulation once more to uh, remind what we saw before. So we have here the universal detector which calculates the x, y, z, h, x, h, y, h, z field. We could activate all these options and use these options for the configuration of the calculation of the e field and of the h field. Um, and now with this information, we can go to the add-ons. So uh, let's have a look at the detector. The add-ons can be accessed also on the detector parameter page in the section add-ons, as the name says. And as Frank already mentioned, we have uh, here first initially an add-on which is used for displaying the data, which we used uh, now all the time. So this opens the dialog we saw before. This is always here. It cannot be removed, but it can be deactivated. And this is the first thing I like to show. Deactivation is simply done by clicking on the item on the bottom before the string or before the name of the add-on. If I deactivate it, okay, now I have no add-on at all available. That's the reason why Virtual Lab says that the universal detector is not specified in a valid way because there would be no output. Uh, then this add-on will not be shown. So let's add, let's add an add-on, and uh, as Frank mentioned, there are two options, at least two options. The first thing is you can add a new add-on. Then, uh, of course, uh, the add-on internally uh, contains some small piece of source code, which is where the source code has access to the input of the, of the add-on. And then, of course, you can write any merit function you're interested. So if you're an expert or if you are, let's say, uh, somehow skilled in this area, uh, then uh, it is quite nice to do some customization. Or what is uh, what I like to demonstrate here also uh, mainly is to use the add-ons we already provided. As Frank mentioned, we have here a small button which is synchronized from the page. This button, if you click it and we have a new detector, then which will automatically download the new detector add-on in a folder, which can be then accessed by the load stuff. So um, we are quite dynamic also in the communication here of uh, new developments, uh, which is also quite an amazing part of this technology. So let's first add the add-on for uh, the pointing vector. Okay, if you click on the, I do it once more, a little bit slower. If you click on the load button here, an open dialog appears where you can select the detector add-on. And uh, by default, a folder is open, which we also use for synchronization. And here we have the following structure. We have some detector add-ons for the lateral extent measurement. So for the size measurement, we have some detector add-ons for photometry and artometry, and also some for region indication, as we explained in the last demonstration. And now uh, to calculate or to find the Detector add-on for, for the pointing vector, we go in the folder radiometry and we select simply pointing vector. Then let's have a look on the pointing vector. We can also configure some parameters, uh, or let's say for the pointing vector, there are no free parameters, but at least we can see the name. So we can even customize the name here if we like to have some special naming for that. Uh, and the first important thing I like to show you here is the readme because this is quite important, so if you click on the README, you get some further information. So first of all, you see the author, in this case it was me, and then we always uh, give some information about the input uh, of the add-on. In this case, it is stated that we need the information of uh, critless or critless, uh, critted electromagnetic fields. We needed all six field components, and it's needed that they are provided in the X component as our detector is already configured. The function is we like to calculate the pointing vector and the output is then the pointing vector as a data view window. Here is some explanation and in addition we also have some uh, let's say um, assistant entry here. Uh, it is not yet filled but it will be filled by the material from the webinars and also some additional materials. So, so here you can access then later more additional information. So let's close it. Uh, doesn't matter. And now I save, I only like to see the pointing vector. So I deactivate now the electromagnetic field quantities. Pointing vector is activated. I perform the simulation. And now I get the pointing vector. So I get here the EX component of the pointing vector, the Y component of the pointing vector, the Z component of the, of the, uh, the Z component of the pointing vector. 
already quite nice if I like to investigate something. But Frank, as Frank also explained, the pointing vector is quite often used as an input for other detector add-ons. Therefore, we add another one. So let's add, for example, let's add irradiance. In, in this case, irradiance, uh, or in, in this case, which lab already knows that uh, the irradiance is dependent on the pointing vector. Let's assume it would not know. In this case, it would be somewhere here. And this is also a very nice concept uh, that we can build these kind of trees. So I can easily change the input of, a, of such a detector on by simply using track and drop. Then I hold the stuff, move it to the pointing vector. And now the logic is the following. We have the data of the universal detector. This is provided to the pointing vector. The output of the pointing vector is provided to the irradiance, and the irradiance is then calculated. Let's check also here the readme. Uh, I will not do it for all the stuff, but at least for some. Here you see we have some oversampling factor. This is quite well explained uh, also in the readme. You see the same structure again. So we define the input, the function, the output. And let's do this simulation. <clears throat> I could activate this uh, function, but uh, this I will do at the end. So let's deactivate it first. And if I do this now, I get now the irradiance. And the irradiance is presented in this radiometric data view. So I have this color view, this human perception view. I can also access uh, false color information. Um, and the next thing I like to do now is to do some photometry. But before we do some photometry, of course, somehow we need some, um, some uh, multi wavelength configuration. And that's the reason why I now change the light source. So I simply use the same source, but I don't like to use it in a monochromatic uh, configuration. I use it. In, I like to use it in RGB configuration. That's the reason why I simply toggle the light source already well prepared. Let's repeat the simulation once more. So we still calculate the irradiance. Now the simulation takes a little bit longer as it comes because we have now three wavelengths which should be processed. And now I get this nice result. This is again the irradiance, which is provided by the radiometric data view. I have the real color view, I have the false color view, and I have even access to uh, to the okay, real color view, false color view, this way. And I have also access whether I like to see uh, for the single wavelengths or whether I like to see for all the wavelengths. I can also switch here through the wavelengths and see the different results. Okay, let's do some uh, photometry. Photometry uh, is, as Frank mentioned, typically based on the radiometric quantity and the associated uh, photometric quantity for the irradiance uh, is the illuminance. So let's use in the, in the subfolder photometry, we select here simply illuminance. Again, Virtual Lab already knows where it should be located uh, in this case. So let's do illuminance. Also, here we check the, the edit uh, dialog or the configuration dialog. And here we see this uh, different selection of this uh, photopic and uh, scotopic curves. So also this is explained in the readme. So it is stated here quite clearly. If you use the zero, you get the photopic luminous function. Uh, the photopic luminous function is used for the integration. And if you get uh, select one, the scotopic one is selected. So let's first do it for the Photopic. Let, let's check what I activated. Okay, only the illuminance. Once more, let's wait a bit. And then we get the photopic curve. And now I can also change it to the scotopic curve. Uh, I could do it in different ways. Let's do it uh, already in a, in a quite nice way that we see that we can also have the different merit functions evaluate at once. So I added the illuminance once more. And here I select, I select now the one, which means this is now scotopic. And I say both should be uh, generated and uh, evaluated. As you can also see, it is also quite interesting because virtually it automatically detects which add-on should be evaluated. For example, we like to evaluate now the illuminance and then virtually it automatically detects that it should first should calculate the pointing vector, then the irradiance. Don't show both, and finally calculate the illuminance. 
And let's do now the simulation once more. Now we get two results. We get the photopic curve and the scotopic curve. Uh, of course, we are in investigating this in the focus, but we could investigate it everywhere. Okay, so far, my comments and my visualizations to the uh, radiometric and photometric quantities, maybe I like to at least mention uh, that we have also uh, uh, some other very interesting and important radiometric quantities, which is, for example, the, the radiant flux, but also a system efficiency add-on that can calculate the system efficiency. So maybe let, let's, let's add the system efficiency. Now this was the wrong one because I like to have it in the X domain. So this one. Let's use it for later. Then we can have a more concrete look. Uh, what I like to show you next is uh, the extent measurement, which is also working quite nicely. And therefore, I simply pl click again uh, Lord and I go to the folder lateral extent measurement. Here we have currently three different kinds of lateral extent measurement. So we have a full width X maximum detector. We have a extent measurement with, which is using the standard deviation. We have also such a power portion uh, calculation. So uh, let's use, for example, the sum of squared percentage. Um, again, we go in the edit dialog. Here we have some parameters. So uh, the parameters are all explained again in the readme, as you can see here. Also the input and the output of the function is explained. And we can say here, for example, that we uh, like to measure this extent on which quantity we like to extend. So this is, for example, the amplitude. Uh, we have some additional parameters, so for example, the percentage value. So how many percentage should we use for the calculation of the extent? And what is also a nice feature, which uh, is, came also or comes also with the 2023 version, is we can use our graphic add-on to to indicate the detected extents in the function itself. Therefore, we activate this flag. Um, there's another flag to specify whether we like to extend the extent by an elliptical or rectangular region. Let's say it's elliptical. And now, of course, we could use this extent. And the cool thing is we could use it at any quantity we are interested. So for example, let's say we like to evaluate it on the point vector. Let's make it a little bit smaller, then it's a little bit more obvious. So this means which let will calculate now the field, of course, then the pointing vector, and then on the pointing vector, we calculate, no, it's not located rightly. Sorry, this is correct. So now you see it. On the pointing vector, we calculate now the lateral extent. So let's do it. Let's again deactivate the other stuff. Uh, and if we do so, then uh, we perform the simulation, and then we get here nicely. We have uh, quite some some information. So the the extent is now calculated per field in the detector result. So we have three wavelengths. So the pointing vector provides information per wavelength, and we have three components, which means we get now nine information about the extents. Uh, and per extent, we get the information of the position and of the size. You can also see it nicely in the view. So if you change, for example, here, the this is the pointing vector x component for the first wavelength, second wavelength, third wavelength. We see here nicely the ellipses. You see here, maybe I can make it a little bit nicer. Yeah, the y component. We simply color it a little bit. So you see here, this is the extent which was evaluated, which was evaluated by the uh, by the add-on detector add-on, and this is not only displayed as numbers in the detector uh, uh, window, but also can be indicated within the view via the detector add-ons. The cool thing with numbers is we can use it, for example, in parametric optimization or in some measurement, in parameter runs or something like this. But sometimes it's also quite important to see what the, an algorithm really detects and uh, to see the indication of this extent in the view. And this can be done here quite nicely. Okay, the last thing, let's close all the documents. The last thing I like to show for the for the for the add-ons inside the universal detector is 
uh, that you can calculate, of course, all also at once. So you can also activate all this stuff at once. Press OK. Let's clear this. And then we do the same simulation, again RGB, and then quite some documents are generated with all this information. So we have we have the size measurement for the pointing vector, we have the pointing vector, which should be also presented. We could decide that it's not displayed. We have the irradiance, and we have also the scotopic and photopic curves of the uh, evaluated illuminance function. Okay, so far to the add-ons in the in the detector but uh, for completeness i like to show you some other really cool features therefore i close all this stuff and uh, use the simulation once more but i only calculate now the field itself the field itself i think we discussed uh, quite something before this also on that so it is not important to discuss now so i have uh, the three wavelengths here I have the x, e, y, e, z, h, x, h, y, h, z component. And now it's also possible, so we calculated this now, and now it's possible to calculate any detector on, on this after our simulation is done. So I don't do any simulation here. So let's put the system away. And then I have now this result. I go to detector add-ons or detector, and I click here, apply detector add-on. And then we follow the same logic. So first we calculate, for example, pointing vector. Then a document uh, dialog appears where we can specify something. We have nothing to specify here. Then we have the pointing vector. Then we, let's say, calculate the irradiance. Then we have our irradiance uh, stuff. Then maybe uh, let's calculate uh, again the illuminance. Let's calculate first for the photopic curve and then for the Scotope curve with a one. So we can calculate even afterwards the inf information quite nicely. And then, of course, we can also do some size measurement. So, for example, let's use here again our percentage uh, add on to have a size measurement. Then I get this, and then I get here maybe uh, something else. So all of this could be done also after the simulation is done, if I have the necessary information to generate, of course, uh, the additional information we like to use. So you see, everything is quite easy to use. And the flexibility of this is super, super high. And it, I think the user experience should be also quite well. So I feel very comfortable when I, like, when I can show you this. Uh, and uh, I think, this is good for first impression, and of course, there will be some additional demonstrations inside our system. So I give back to Frank. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really very cool stuff. Also, really, I, I like uh, I like a lot. Good. Okay, now we come to to the end of our uh, webinar. I just uh, need to. Is my screen visible now? It is. Yes. Okay, cool. Then um, uh, we come to the uh, final thinking that I just do one more French points, you know, and then I give back to Christian for the final demonstration. Uh, but um, of course, we are uh, quite well known uh, also in the field of ARVR for the Light Guide Toolbox, which started, of course, with the whole lens one. There was a quite a, a um, it triggered quite some boom in this area uh, where the end is not still clear uh, what is going on uh, and how much will go into finally into the market thinking. Uh, but anyway, the VR AR market is of, of great interest and uh, the light guides also. And here we did some improvements. We increased the modeling and design speed uh, in this, and there will be uh, much more to come in this year uh, to do things much faster um, and even faster as we have it now. We add some additional tools, um, which I also discussed in the Monday webinars, um, a better indication of the uniformity in the eye box and a more interactive uh, working with the 
regions. Uh, then, of course, now it's very clear the radiometric uh, and, in particular, photometry measurements are now also available in the light guide toolbox. So we can discuss about lumen and looks and uh, all these kind of nits and so on. So that can be measured now, um, and that is very, very essential. And now. Finally, we also like to do the following. Um, um, Christian will show you that now this add-on technology can be also combined with a few because we always had the desire, if we take, for example, this kind of let's uh, set up, we like to have a detector here. Then we like to see also the regions in the operating layout. Um, we like to see where the detector thickness are related to which place in the in the um, um, grating layout. And that is now also possible with the detector add-on. And that's what Christian will finally show here. OK, thank you, Frank. Last demonstration of our webinar series. I am sharing my screen. You see it? Yes. No. 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 OK, perfect. OK, uh, let's keep it compact. So. Uh, Let's first have a look uh, on a 3D view of the system I prepared for demonstration. Uh, people who are familiar with this kind of technology, of course, know this stuff. So this is uh, a light guide where we use some gratings to couple in, to have an iPupil expansion, and to outcouple the light. Um, and of course, as Frank mentioned, the cool thing is we can now nicely use also the, the radiometric uh, quantities. For example, to evaluate the distribution in the eye box. So I prepared this also. Um, let's have a look. So then I get, for example, the radiance. I can also check the illuminance, whatever, as I described before. And what I should like to show you now is something a little bit different. Uh, I like to have a look at the field inside the light guide. Therefore, I cut the light guide into two surfaces, and I'd like to place a detector directly after the first surface. Uh, the detector is quite large, so I like to detect all the light which is traveling through the light guide. And if I perform this simulation, I get the following result. This looks somehow like this. And uh, I can already spoil a bit where is what. So here would be my, my, ink, uh, my ink couple grating. Here somewhere will be my EPE grating, and here is my outcouple grating somewhere. And the first thing, which is also quite nice and quite important for discussions uh, of physics uh, of this kind of devices, is that, of course, with the new de de detector technology, we have now access to uh, also the polarization information. So we can also activate here, for example, again, polarization ellipses. And if we do so, we Get the same result but with, with additional polarization information. So you see how the polarization is developing during the propagation through the light guide. Okay, but now we found out it is also quite typical and quite a helpful feature to see how this light distribution is associated with the layout of our creating regions. And that's the reason uh, I developed some detector add on for that. Uh, once again, let's have a look how we add. Detector add-on, we simply go to the detector we like to edit. We go here to the Lord button, select in the region indication uh, section, the add region information from light guide dot add-on. Now it's uh, included. So we turn off once again the electromagnetic peak quantity. And here we have some parameters which are quite nicely explained in the readme. So we have to specify the parameters uh, of the light guide of the uh, 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 we have to identify the the region which we like to indicate in our view and this indication is done by three indices we need the index of the of the light guide component where the surface is uh, located on which the creating region is uh, placed on then we need to identify the surface index inside the light guide and finally we need to specify the index of the creating region this is nicely illustrated also uh, in the readme. Also, by the way, by a new feature uh, for this help stuff uh, that we can now nicely add, for example, explanation pictures. So the index of the light guide component is this value. The index of the surface within the light guide is this value. The index of the grating region is this value. Okay, 
I know what I have to configure. So uh, the index of the lightweight component for this example is two. The index of the surface is one because I have only one. And then uh, let's first have a look where my incoupling grating is. And this has index of one. Let's check it also in the UI. Here is the two. So the component index is two. The surface index is one. And the index of the incoupling region is also one. Let me check once more. I'm not sure whether I specified it correctly. Two, one, one. Everything is good. Okay, let's perform the simulation. And then we get this. And here you already see where the detector add on adds the graphic add on for the region, which indicates where my incoupling grating is. We can also customize a few. I did it also for, for other things like the extent measurement. So I can say it should be, uh, let's make it green, for example. And then you see here is my incoupling region. And here I can already get some nice information because I see whether my beam fits into the incoupling region. So this gives me already some insight which could be helpful for further investigations. Okay, with the cascading technology we can use now with the add-ons, I simply do the following. I add this add-on three times. So I add it again and I add it again. Now I say, the output of the first should be the input of the second, and the output of the second should be the input of the third. Let's configure the parameter 212 is the EPE grating, and 21 and 3 is the outcouple grating. I only like to see the last one because the intermediate steps are not of importance. Let's close all the other documents that we can focus on the window. We like to discuss now, and here we see now very nicely, we see all our regions. Let's configure this stuff a little bit uh, with some colors. So let's again select a green one, maybe a yellow one, and maybe let's select uh, Yellow, I have orange one. And now I see nicely the information of the field in combination with the polarization ellipses, which are also an add on, and in combination with the geometry layout of which, which, which the detector added from the system to the detector result. So I think this is quite amazing. It shows more or less the full complexity of all the features uh, the detector error which uh, were introduced um, in combination, of course, with all the other add-ons, uh, the photometric and radiometric uh, quantities. Of course, I could do this also uh, not on the field data, but on uh, irradiance data, for example. Um, but yeah, I'm now super flexible. And uh, I think it's, first of all, quite nice to see this. And uh, as I explained, for example, on the in-couple grading, it's also, it provides also some quite useful information which can be used for further adaption of your optical setup. Okay, I think this was enough for a demonstration. Good. Yeah. Um, that is a very impressive piece of technology um, in my opinion. And, and I'd like to mention here that uh, we have with this picture, which you just saw before, we have really this very interesting combination of concepts. We have the add-ons, which provide us with all the physical data about the detector, uh, which the detector should measure. And we have, with the add-ons, we have now the possibility to add additional information, like position ellipses and regions, um, to indicate more where um, physical quantities are too related to be. So we can add more information to get more information out of the view. That's very nice. And we also have the following situation. Uh, I like to mention that these regions um, are a concept which we also introduce more and more in virtual lab. For example, we can calculate efficiencies. There's a, there's a signal window here. We can calculate 
via an add-on, how much energy flows through this window by the same window specification. This can be done also in the add-ons. Anyway, that means we have the additional concept of graphical add-ons, where you see here how they work, and we have the additional concept, which is more and more used, uh, of regions in virtual diffusion. Okay, and that is uh, now a point to come to the end of this um, webinar today. Uh, the last one in the series where we'd like to introduce you to the amazing features we have added in virtual fusion 23.1 and mm, definitely much more coming this year because now 23 has formed the platform to be uh, to add a lot of things in a even faster way and uh, it is obvious that this kind of approach with this universal detector and the detector ons is a major breakthrough and we in particular think that it's extremely important that it now allows us to add detector functions independent of the release, which is really a benefit for the service to our customers to provide any kind of detector in due time. Okay, so far this I give back to Olga. <laughs>